So uh, thanks everybody for being patient while I found the room. Uh, today I'm going to talk about this kind of US-China friction, especially in regard to technology, and kind of turn that toward the uh, technology management imperatives. I'm Richard Dasher. I direct a research center at Stanford called the US Asia Technology Management Center. We were in electrical engineering for 25 years, but two years ago we moved over to the Stanford Global Studies program. So uh, I've been on the news about this topic a number of times, but this is really one of the first times that I've tried to put together a real honest to goodness lecture on the topic. So we'll be very interactive. I will be looking forward to your questions and your comments, and uh, they may be reflected in the version of the slides that we actually save. So first of all, I want to talk about this whole kind of feeling of deja vu. I feel like I've been here before with technology conflict, and then we'll talk about understanding how the U.S.-China friction has come to be the way that it is. Finally, I'm going to talk about a term you hear a lot in regard to politics, which is decoupling, how to disengage the economies of the U.S. and China, and what's going to happen with global supply chains, and finally talk about implications for technology managers. So yes, com computer systems are very much at the heart of this conflict. Uh, we've had recent issues with Huawei being uh, named as an entity with which uh, U.S. companies may not do business. And um, we have had also real concern. Kai-Fu Lee last year wrote a big book on AI superpowers about how the U.S. and China were really going to go head to head uh, in regard to artificial intelligence. So really, a lot of the, the conflicts now are right around areas that this class is interested in. But I sure remember Japan back in the 1980s. I moved to Japan in 1986. I was in charge of the Japan and Korea training programs for American diplomats. So I was an employee of the U.S. State Department. I had Foreign Service credentials. I was actually a section head of the embassy, although our language school, our area school was down in Yokohama. And when I got there, it was all about memory chips. Um, we were hearing that um, the uh, Japanese had been stealing IP right and left. We were hearing an awful lot about, about government industry collusion, how the Japanese government was doing espionage on behalf of Japanese companies and were really trying to take over the world from America. We had a lot of uh, criticism about research and development consortia that were subsidized by the Japanese government. Um, incidentally, one of the immediate outcomes of that was the creation of the research center that I used to run at Stanford, the Center for Integrated Systems. Because the Japanese had this big consortium to study VLSI, uh, large-scale computer chips, the uh, word is that John Young of HP and um, John Linville of Stanford were in line at a gas station and talk to each other about the need for um, some sort of way for American industry to come together. And because of worries about antitrust problems, the university was about the only choice they had. So they created CIS really to do advanced research in semiconductors. Um, Japan was really criticized at the time about having an unfair low cost of capital and um, that the domestic market was closed. And it's true. American memory chip companies had less than 6 or 7% of the Japanese memory chip market back in 1983. Uh, so fast forward to about the year you know, 2015, and uh, China is kind of the new kid on the block. And the nature of the kind of conflict is no longer memory chips, it's really integrated network technologies and things like artificial intelligence that are critical enabling technologies for all of the new kinds of hardware and software. Um, China's being accused of IP theft. 
that's being accused of uh, government industry collusion, especially think about Huawei, which, yeah, is kind of borderline. Is it really a private company or not? Uh, we have a number of policies in China that people are worried about. Chinese companies are accused of an unfair low cost of capital, and the domestic market in China sure looks closed. If you're in China, unless you're on some sort of a VPN, you're not going to be able to use Google, you're not going to be able to see Facebook, you're not going to be able to use Twitter. The list goes on. So um, there were some differences. Japan never had the potential to be a major rival of the United States like China does. First of all, uh, Japan was completely dependent on America for security. Uh, and also, Japan had half the population of the U.S. With China, let's face it, if income levels per person in China reach that of the United States, which is, you know, you've got to want people to be able to improve their lives. If they come up to the level of individual income that's in the U.S., the Chinese economy will be four times as big as the U.S. because there are four times as many people there. Um, the object of concern between the U.S. and China is arguably even more pervasive and ubiquitous than, you know, computer chips were back in uh, the early 1980s. The... Uh, world is in cloud computing now. 96% of companies are using cloud-based solutions for one thing or another. Also, more and more applications are real-time, and uh, analytics is an absolutely essential part of dealing with the huge amounts of data that are being created every day. Smartphones are everywhere. And so, uh, actually, I think that the technology conflict between the U.S. and China in regard to things like 5G networks, in regard to uh, artificial intelligence, are really incredibly pervasive. And China is not necessarily an American ally. This means that there is a national security aspect to American concerns about advanced technology even more than applied to the U.S.-Japan conflict a few years ago. Now, the thing about government industry collusion, you have to look at in terms of how technologies develop. People outside the U.S. really get worried about the role of the U.S. Defense Department. That DARPA, you know, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, is some sort of something that's feeding everything to the American military, when really this reflects one of those strange things about how American R&D can be funded. Over the history since World War II, Americans don't like to see the government supporting big companies, even if they do. If you can put that under the label of defense, you can get money. And I know a lot of people who've told me that, you know, basically the difference between a DARPA presentation and a Department of Commerce presentation is that you'll have a picture of a tank or a fighter plane somewhere on the DARPA presentation. There's not a whole lot of other difference. But, you know, the Internet started out as a defense project. And uh, with China, you do have uh, this kind of comprehensive view of national development where the government is taking the lead to develop infrastructure of various sorts. And that certainly led to a lot of the early deployment of artificial intelligence in China. Um, there will be a handoff to industry for innovation. R&D can be fun uh, funded by a government, but eventually as the government starts to support things that move into industry for commercial application, the government starts to want to buy off the shelf. It's cheaper. Um, consumers benefit from access, but it was not a trivial point when ARPANET started being the internet back in the late 1980s. Um, so industry efficiency takes over and it's, you know, the globalization that we have seen since about 1985, this is an entire generation that has been built on globalization, including Silicon Valley. 
We look for the best providers, meaning the most cost efficient providers as well as quality providers. And we look for international markets to support the next generation of R&D. One reason that Huawei did as well as they did with 5G was Chinese government investment in infrastructure. But the other reason why didn't the American telecom companies get into this is because they assumed they'd be able to buy off the shelf. They were looking for better value added layers of the technology stack and American companies are much further ahead or have been until recently in regard to the data processing side. But the basic radio access, all that kind of stuff, that's commodity work. So sure enough, the American telcos didn't invest in 5G. They were going to buy it. Um, so this kind of thing has happened. And kind of fast forwarding to where the point of this whole talk is going to go today, American companies innovate their way out of trouble. So one of the companies that was suffering the most during the memory chip wars between the US and Japan was Intel. Intel was a memory chip company until about 1985 or 86 when um, Intel decided to switch over to this emerging architecture around a CPU, around a microprocessor. Up until that time, computers had been mainframes, and it was really the advent of a standard microprocessor that enabled the whole development of PCs, that enabled the whole development of client-server architecture, and really has led to the whole kind of data center-based uh, cloud architecture that we have now. So um, I think that what has happened is that America innovated its way out, Look at the history of Silicon Valley. Every seven or eight years, we have another major kind of technology revolution that leads to a new industry, and we will have one or two world-leading companies coming out of Silicon Valley. That's the way Silicon Valley stays ahead. Now, unfortunately, other parts of the country, especially where manufacturing is centered, aren't leading these new revolutions, and they've been kind of left behind by innovation. And this is the origin of a lot of the political kind of conflicts that have led to the desire by America to decouple. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. It was a first class. Yeah. But it did not seem to me at all that it was a project based kind of thing. It was really, it was, it didn't be more research. Yeah. A lot of people did not necessarily agree with what other people were doing. And over time, the best thing I heard, I think, that characterized the history of the was uh, we tended to reject king voting, like the other thing, in favor of. Rough consensus and running code. And as competitive network protocols came out, this was even before GCP. Yeah. Um, there were people working on. First off, I recall both ATT and IBM saying the fact that this would never be worked. Yeah. Which of course is true. But I remember the head of AT and T Labs telling me in about 1993 that the internet was doomed. Yeah. And there are. <laughs> Yeah, well, and you see, a lot of the security stuff that we have now relate to that kind of history. It was an open method of sharing information and data among researchers. In fact, if you ask Todd and Turf, they deliberately did that at Bob Dylan. They deliberately did security off yeah. because they knew that if they went to the security morass, distributed sense of it was like the first thing that Bob said. Now, what do you make damn sure if they get one of your nodes, if you do not have nothing, 
Right. Anyway, one note is nothing. It's the military yeah. part was very separate from the commercial. Yeah, okay. I think that's true. But I think that your point is a good example of how a government-funded research project, which basically established an infrastructure on government money, uh, was then available for the commercial sector to use and take advantage of. And really, the first people to do that were probably the Netscape folks sometime around 1994. Go ahead. Um, what most people don't seem to know is that packet switching began many years earlier as part of the SAGE air defense system, and it worked there. Uh, it, that happened to be a giant fraud uh, in that it never worked as a, as a defense system because it was unable to track bombers from radar data. Okay. But it was kept going for 20 Was it a latency years. problem or what was the, uh, was it a latency problem? Why it didn't work? The problem or? was that real bombers use radar jamming. Okay. And the computers could not cope with the amount of data that was being pumped at them yeah. Uh, and that fact was kept, it was classified secret, so that if anybody talked about it, you went to jail. And by doing that, they were able to keep it going for 25 years, the biggest fraud of the 20th century. Well, I remember in the mid-1990s, there were two kind of major kind of packet switching uh, technologies that were in competition. The Japanese were promoting OCI, and TCP IP was coming along. It was starting to be popular. But I think that the system here in the US gradually saw that standardization. And as that standardized, that really allowed the internet to fundamentally change the nature of network computing. I remember spreading ethernet cable between computers in the State Department, back when I worked in the State Department. <laughs> and uh, basically, the length had to be exactly the same. You know, you had to have exactly, you know, the same number of millimeters length cable between the computers, or the sequencing wouldn't work. Yeah, right. Uh, so anyway, as the internet really spread, basically a local area network became nothing more than something bounded by a firewall. Right, and now you've got internet protocol inside just about everything, even your toaster and your refrigerator. So uh, what you see is you do see the spread of standards. And you know, kind of the thing with uh, what's happening with industry evolution and the US-China friction, there are some new areas like 5G networks and also uh, I would have to say that um, anything you would put on that technology stack, like a self-driving car, are areas in which China is developing its own solutions. And a lot of government infrastructure investment has happened in China that has, bothers American industry a lot. Uh, but um, really, if you look at the history since the memory chip wars in, with Japan, uh, the U.S. innovated its way to do just fine. At least Silicon Valley did just fine. And the Japanese and Korean companies kind of get stuck in middle levels of kind of this evolution. They will get government support for research and build out a lot of stuff, but they haven't been able to get the kind of commercial winning killer applications. Well, we can get we can get into that. Although I think these days uh, that is an area of computing that has gone ahead so far. You know, even ICANN is rep re is recognizing internet addresses that can be put together in eight bit code instead of uh, 
English type, uh, Roman letter code. Let me go through the slides, okay? We'll come back. So anyway, um, one of the things that doesn't tend to happen that much in other economies that happens here is the use of disruptive innovation. The startup companies here really have brought in a lot, but they've done that um, because we're kind of freewheeling and we will let them take revenues away from existing companies. Um, you know, Google and, and these companies really got to be as big as they are by disrupting the newspaper industry and then the TV industry. So um, that's the kind of thing where if there is real close government industry cooperation, the government tends to be able to protect the industries more. You get a protected industry that is not as agile and not as uh, competitive. So right now, up until this point, China has been all about uh, building out infrastructure, developing the economy. It is finally moving into the stage of really being an innovation-driven economy. I got some slides on that. Um, but first of all, look at these things, you know, if you're comparing what has happened, right, with the memory chips, the uh, memory chip market really left Japan and went to South Korea. Um, the flat panel display market left Japan and went to South Korea. We were really worried about uh, Japanese working flat panel displays when I first started here at Stanford. And now the majority of manufacturing is going on in Taiwan. Cell phones may go all the way to China. Uh, telecom networks may go all the way to China. Uh, but uh, the U.S. does okay by looking at value-added businesses that take advantage of these new technologies. We innovate our way out of trouble. Um, so let's look a little bit more at how we got to where the US and China are. <laughs> First of all, how many people here know that China's economy is already bigger than the United States? Okay. Yeah, in purchasing power. And it's getting close in nominal terms too. Um, in fact, the way that this developed looks like this, and this is why China has been so interesting people to people for a long time. Um, the, the China chart is going way up to the top, and America had the transition point was somewhere around 2015. Um, India is going up, but not nearly as much as China. Now, as an economy develops, the World Economic Forum recognizes three main stages of economic development. and. The first stage, what we would typically call an early stage developing economy, they call factor driven. And this is where you see huge numbers of people moving to cities. So in the United States in the late 1800s, before the war, in Japan after World War II, in Korea in the early 1980s, um, you have industrialization going on. And it really looks like a gold rush. China has looked an awful lot like a gold rush where the most important thing was to get there first, establish your claim, and start your business. Um, the government was essentially doing basic commercial code laws, basic IP laws. Um, the second stage is when the first generation of companies become successful. Suddenly, the economy is growing at such a pace that you have a labor shortage. And this is the stage at which governments often try to pick winners. The Japanese picked some of their Keidatsu companies after World War II and, and really did help them out. Um, the kind of key competitive advantage at this is how to develop new markets and scale up. It doesn't matter whether they're domestic or international. If you've got a big local market, you can scale up domestically first. Japan auto industries really only started to scale up internationally when they needed the revenue to support domestic competition. And I think that you compare that to Korea, which has half the number of people or a third of the number of people as in Japan, and you see earlier internationalization. They have to go to international markets earlier. 
And then you see someplace like Israel, and, and you better be thinking international from the first day you start your company. Um, this is where high quality becomes kind of a key feature of the best companies in the economy. Uh, you also see the kind of operational efficiency, like just-in-time purchasing and all that kind of stuff. And it's only after you have a domestic base of industries that governments get serious about enforcing IP. Why should we enforce intellectual property if all the intellectual property is owned by somebody foreign? You know, the people that got me into office or that I need to support me in office are domestic. So once I have a group of domestic people who need IP enforcement, it will happen. Uh, then really along about 35,000 a year in uh, revenue per person is when you get the next generation after that. And I think part of it's generational. In an efficiency-driven economy, you have people who work in line jobs in factories earning 60 or $70 an hour. It's great, you know, but unfortunately that era doesn't last. And most of these people don't want their kids working online jobs in factories. Education spreads through the economy. And as higher education spreads through the economy, nobody really wants the old jobs that were sort of the key to the previous generation. So this is where creative new ideas really become the key competitive strength. The brilliance of Steve Jobs, knowing what people would have to have before they had ever seen it. Um, this means that for a company, you have to be able to allow enough risk to be trying out these fresh new ideas. Um, it's at this point that you really see the government's trying to support entrepreneurship and put in fiscal money to help bridge the valley of death, right, where you've got development costs. And, you know, in the United States, it was the early 1980s when the SBIR grant system started to really help high-tech companies get from the research stage into the commercialization stage where they could talk to private sector investors. Um, so these, this is really kind of important backdrop to remember what's going on in China, especially because now if you look at China, China is, as a nation, still at the end of the efficiency-driven stage, partly because the interior is still so undeveloped. But in the East Coast cities, it's acting more and more like an innovation-driven economy. So right now, you're seeing the first Chinese companies that are really trying to go global. Who really went global in terms of sales before Alibaba and Tencent? Solar PV. Who? Solar PV. Solar PV. They were actually selling more in China. I, my sense is, did they... I think that was a little after Alibaba came along when they really ran the people out of the business here. What you had was you had a very protected market in China so that all the people here tried to go into China and sell there and they couldn't compete. Um, but yeah, that's a, it's a good point. Finally, you're seeing globalization. And so they're aiming at global markets. Uh, another thing going on in China this year is a huge rise in VC. We'll talk a little bit about there's also worry in China that as a structure, the economy is not ready to support higher levels of income. There's something called the middle income trap that hits around this, you know, sixteen to seventeen thousand dollars a year, where it's very difficult for companies to really change their way of thinking to see their competitiveness as being driven by fresh new ideas instead of by, you know, quality and scale up and that kind of thing. Um, in Japan, you do have an innovation-driven economy. Same thing in South Korea. But uh, the big firms haven't really gotten comfortable with that yet. The biggest thing is they haven't learned how to deal with startup companies well. I mean, that's what we've got with this disruptive innovation thing. It's not just a lot of startup companies, it's the big companies buying from the startup companies and partnering with them and acquiring them so that the big companies continue to grow fast. Um, 
India is an interesting place. Uh, it's really islands of highly advanced technologies in the middle of a very much an early stage developing economy. So you have the international business sector in India, and then you have the domestic sector in India. Um, I think 97% of Infosys's revenues come from foreign countries. So it's, you know, India is kind of an interesting space. Now, China has made a lot of news in the last five years, but really, um, you know, U.S. business has been having a hard time in China for a long time. Not, this is not new. Uh, the domestic market in China is huge. You see rapid economic growth, and so everybody's really interested in it. Um, China also had a lot of strength because of the labor cost difference between there and the U.S., not only because workers were cheap, but they worked hard. They had a great work ethic, and the level of literacy, the level of education is very high. So it's not only that you had a cheap workforce, but you had a really good workforce. Um, but along about five or six years ago, the uh, actually closer to 10 now, the economy in China really suddenly reached a drastic slowdown. Part of this was the timing was engineered by the government, but it had to. As an economy moves up this scale to being, you know, from efficiency driven to innovation driven, the infrastructure development contributes less to the economy than does consumer spending. And so now China is a more consumer driven economy, but the whole level of growth is somewhere around 6%. Um, now, as a general rule, this is not about China. If the economy slows down, you protect your people first. So you get a protectionist economy when the economy slows. That's just really natural. Uh, and I have to say that in China, as in the U.S., we have a real kind of, you know, America first idea. And in China, there's a real, you know, China first attitude, especially among young people. Young people are very, you know, patriotic in China. Um, so... The other thing that's happening, though, is the disappearance of the labor cost differences. China is suddenly a lot less attractive as a manufacturing location for American businesses, partly because of the difficulties of dealing with the government and the system and so forth, but also because Vietnam's a lot cheaper. And you can move things to other places and do just as well as you've been doing in China. Um, but China has had has grown up in the last 35 years as a key point in the global supply chain. China is the place where the final product tends to be put together, right? My iPhone was probably put together in Shenzhen, but the stuff inside the iPhone comes from eight or nine different countries. And depending on how many levels you go down, uh, the chips in the iPhone may come from Japan and Korea, but those chips themselves involve designs that were made in one country and a chip that was fabbed down in TSMC in Taiwan and then mounted somewhere in Malaysia. And so you, you have these global supply chain, but China was the point for final assembly. And then from China, it would go to typically advanced markets. Um, this is still kind of the situation. And the decoupling that the American government is trying to do is to try to get American companies to pull their um, manufacturing, meaning their final assembly, back to the US. We'll come back to that. Um, yeah, it's interesting. China is a really tough place to do business. Speaking of solar cells, I knew the person that represented the German Q-cell company in China, a German guy who spoke fluent Mandarin, lived there for 10 years, achieved nothing. Finally, uh, he left and quit, and, you know, the company later went bankrupt. So China is a really tough place to do business, always has been. Uh, there were regulations in China and also cultural things in China that uh, strongly favored 
or required you to have a local partner. So I lost some money in this way. I invested in a company that was uh, based outside of China, and so they created a local partner in China and started to develop the China market and allowed the company that I invested in to go bankrupt while the China company did just fine because the, the only relationship between the China company and the parent was a technology license. Uh, anyway, so, you know, that's been around, that was 20 years ago. That was a long time. Um, yes, there has been a lot of intellectual property theft. No one will argue that China has not been violating the terms of the World Trade Organization. And that's just one of those things. For a long time, American business, because they had this image of being able to do work in China, would kind of put pressure on the American government not to enforce a uh, situation against China too much. And, um, you know, what they would do is they'd come up with other strategies. No one would send their most advanced technology to China, right? You send last generation technology to China. Or, if you've got a complicated system, you send everything except the real critical components to China. The, the, the commodity stuff you get from there. But, you know, the thing that really makes your system work, you do somewhere else. Um, one of my favorite stories is how Microsoft dealt with the piracy. Something like 96% of the copies of Windows 95, this is an old story, but... 96% of the, of the copies of Windows 95 in China were pirate. So what did Microsoft do? Microsoft implemented a service-based business model where when somebody would have a problem with their Windows system, they would call up Microsoft support, and Microsoft support would say, oh, I'm sorry, you don't have a registered version. We'll be happy to send you one for a maintenance contract. <laughs> So, you know, they found ways around it. Um, the companies that were suffering from trademark infringement, and there are different laws in China about what you can trademark and how you have to justify the trademark, uh, or patent even, um, it was kind of pointless to take it to Chinese court. So instead, like the movie makers in the U.S., would have a real close relationship with the customs officials in China and tell them that some, you know, contraband stuff is coming in at a warehouse, go raid it. And so they would use this administrative action instead of litigation in China. So American companies have known how to do this. If you're a, a company of any size, you bring in your people and, and you find out what to do. Uh, but more recently, China is really moving into the realm of being a direct competitor in advanced technology to what we're doing. I think this goes back 20 years. I think it really starts with a major move in the Chinese university system back in 1998 to consolidate and create world-class universities. China universities have been built on the old Soviet Union model, where they were narrowly focused on particular areas. So, for instance, Zhejiang University down in Hangzhou is the, merger, the result of a merger of five different universities in that city. Uh, and they threw a lot of money at them. Then there have been various policies that people really worry about. Indigenous innovation, meaning the government was going to support innovation in China as opposed to buying off the shelf from somewhere else. They had the made in China policy that they've kind of toned down a lot, but it was basically something where they were going to promote national makers. And the whole thing about artificial intelligence being a major national strategic priority in China has also made a lot of people nervous. Um, but sure enough, as China has developed, their IP enforcement is much better than it used to be. That is something that a lot of people are not aware of, but foreign companies in China actually have a higher percentage of court case wins than do domestic companies. And, um, you know, not only that, but China is concerned about 
this being a competitive advantage. So they've tried to make sure that the, the time it takes to educate a uh, lawsuit is short. It's one of the shortest in the world. Um, so the other thing that's happened is a drastic what increase. Made, what made that happen? Why did they find the problem? Because they've got a domestic industry. Now they've got domestic players who are going to be really unhappy if, if somebody next door steals their IP. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, it, it's a great question. And it is really because now it's to everybody's advantage to have stability in terms of knowing what you own when you own IP. Um, now that doesn't mean it's disappeared, but it hasn't disappeared here either, right? I mean, we have IP enforcement problems here sometimes. Um, so the second thing, the, the third thing there is drastic increase in money being thrown at new innovative ideas, meaning the venture capital industry. Here's a chart of venture capital in the US and in China from 2010 to the first half of 2018. The amount has come to be about the same amount as in the United States. Now, there is a second slide that I didn't put into this presentation the number of deals is still not as much as in the US. So you have more big deals, big venture capital investments in China. And um, part of that is probably because the public markets in China are still not exactly, you know, great. <laughs> uh, yeah. Where does venture capital come from in China as opposed to the US? Some of it is laundered government money, some of it. But uh, it's, you know, uh, it, yeah, I did have... <laughs> well, it depends, because a lot of times what you'll have is you'll have money from a bank going into a venture capital fund, but where did the bank give the money, right? Especially since, the, you know, at least half the banks are state-owned. So um, I think that you do see government interest there. You see an alignment of the venture capital industry with government priorities. But that's kind of logical. If I was a venture capital investor, I'd go with what I think is going to make money too. Uh, so anyway, that's a big deal. And the other thing that I'd like to point out is the government has been a major customer for a lot of the advanced technology solutions. Um, since time is this facial recognition company that's based in Hong Kong but does most of their business in China and I dare say probably 70% of their income has come from government projects. They're the people that sell the cameras to the cities to watch the people crossing the street. Uh, so, you know, the, the government as a customer is a big thing. Anyway, um, the kind of final section of the talk is really about this um, decoupling and what happens when the supply chains unravel. First of all, um, the um, U.S. government is actively trying to disengage the American economy from the Chinese economy. The tariffs, which are a way of supposedly leveling the playing field if you think the products in another country are unfairly cheap, um, have turned into something where basically the government's trying to make components more expensive. And, you know, our president sent a note to uh, Tim Cook at Apple saying, we really think you ought to move your manufacturing back to the U.S. Um, now, if we do it, the Chinese are going to do it. So this means it happens in both ways. Our stuff going into China become more expensive. So yes, if business does that, things pull back. Uh, there's an increased scope of enforcement of export controls. Now, export controls apply mostly to technologies without regard to which foreign country you're talking about. 
there are technologies that may have military applications as well as commercial applications. First of all, what can't have a military application now, right? I mean, that's a real issue. There are more than 650 pages of technologies in very small print that are subject to the Export Control Reform Act. And, uh, you know, half a dozen different U.S. government departments are enforcing these. Department of State enforces some, Department of Defense enforces some, Department of Commerce enforces some. Uh, there's an increased scrutiny of foreign investments in American firms. The term you'll hear most of the time is CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. That's the group inside the government. It's an interagency group that's supposed to manage this process of looking to see if accepting a foreign investor into a U.S. startup is going to lead American technology to go outside the U.S. in violation of the export control. So CFIUS is a big deal. The actual regulations themselves are just this past year, F-I-R-R-M-A, FIRMA. Um, but yeah, this is, this is noticeable. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Another thing that is definitely aimed at decoupling is the much more severe um, environment for getting a visa to come to the United States. And I haven't really paid attention to reciprocity by China yet, but certainly in the U.S., this is a big deal. I had about 30% of my visitors from China last year were denied a visa for short-term visits to do things like open seminars. <laughs> and I think that a lot of it is not so much the regulation as it is an attitude that's had to develop in the State Department to preserve their budget in the current administration. State Department officials are, I think, evaluated on how many visas they turn down. <laughs> that's a suspicion. I don't have any, you know, don't have any kind of uh, evidence on that. And then the last thing to mention are these entity lists of specific companies that the U.S. prohibits from doing business with American firms. So you shift it out. Now, these appear to be based in a 1980s style view of how to rebalance the trade situation between the U.S. and China. Yes, the U.S. and China, the U.S. has a huge trade, uh, trade deficit to China. Um, but, you know, these kinds of decoupling issues are not really going to help. The U.S. firms are not going to take all those jobs back to the U.S. And unlike Japan, China has a big enough domestic market that it figures it can do without the U.S., especially if it can get to third country markets. Um, also, I think we're going to start to see the impact on things like inflation and uh, prices, consumer prices here in the U.S. before too long. And so if this is what it takes to get the trade back to balance with less of a trade deficit, the, you know, the, the medicine's going to be very, you know, unpleasant to take here. Um, I think that you're seeing shift of the supply chains from China to other countries. You're seeing really the development of a completely different system in China. I remember 12 or 13 years ago, China announced that it was going to do its own technology standards for a number of critical uh, computer-related technologies, including Wi-Fi, including computer operating systems. You can't do this unless you have a domestic market that is potentially huge. So because they had a, a big domestic market, uh, they'll, they'll go a different route. Huawei's already announced a new operating system for its phones since it cannot use Google Android, although maybe that's been delayed. Forget what the situation is this week. But in any case, Huawei developed a new operating system based on a Russian model. So 
you know, we're not necessarily going to be able to hold them to American things. And I think that um, as U.S. companies stay out of China, then uh, China companies may stay out of the U.S. What's wrong with that picture? How many Japanese cars do we sell here? <laughs> you know, how many, uh, what percentage of my iPhone comes from Japan? Uh, American consumers have benefited greatly by having more people competing in world markets. So the benefits of globalization have not been understood by the American public. That's one of the real problems. Now, in that situation, what do you do if you're a technology manager? First of all, be prepared to pay a lot more to your lawyer. I hear it costs about $300,000 to do due diligence that you're in compliance with CFIUS. And probably the export control would, you know, throw in export controls for another hundred or something. Uh, so the law firms here, there have been at least 10 major presentations about export controls and CFIUS by law firms in this area in the last two months. Um, Law yeah, <laughs> if, if their stock is available. <laughs> uh, the other problem with these new regulations, though, is the time that it takes. It takes about six months to do the due diligence on a foreign investor, which means that I'm hearing things like a venture capitalist came to me the other day and said, we want to hire a new associate, make sure they're an American citizen. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, you know, that kind of time factor is going to be a major disadvantage for startups here. Um, but the real competition is moving to Southeast Asia, right? Uber lost out to uh, Didi, although they were both trying to get into the Southeast Asia markets. Now, when Chinese companies move into a foreign market, they tend to buy a local partner or buy into a local partner and increase their presence that way. Americans tend to think that the whole world acts like America, and so they just start their company overseas office there. So Uber found out that they couldn't be successful, and they sold out their Southeast Asia business to a Singapore-based competitor, Grab which incidentally has almost a billion dollars of money from the Chinese company Didi Chuxing. So, um, yeah, in, anyway, uh, this is this third country markets. Will it be America versus the rest of the world or will it be China versus the rest of the world? And the U.S. Is, has been putting serious pressure on other countries not to adopt Huawei's 5G system but they've only had limited success. And I think Brazil was the most recent one to say, we'll buy from whoever we want to buy. So, um, you know, this, this kind of global competition is definitely going to be two spheres of influence rubbing into each other. But the good side of that is if Chinese companies do go global more, they may have to open up the China market more. The main reason that um, you would want to open a protected market to foreign competition is if your own companies need to be able to compete in foreign countries. Makes sense. So um, I think that that's, you know, possibly a, uh, might actually, there's a possibility that it won't be a terrible outcome. But the last thing, the real imperative for a technology manager here is innovate. If you see something that looks like the, you know, it's going to be owned by somebody else, come up with a new business model, come up with a new technology. And um, that's, that's our tradition here in Silicon Valley. The kind of close on this is that I think the U.S. and China will probably reach some sort of trade agreement. Um, I think that there is too much pressure on the countries to completely go apart. Um, and I think that um, if 
This does involve greater global attention on the part of the China government, then maybe it'll be good for China companies and maybe it'll be good for everybody. Uh, but it is still a risky situation. And the other thing is China needs to watch out about what economic development model it looks at. They're in serious danger of following the path of the Japanese and the Koreans, meaning big companies that have too much control over capital and too much control over market access, and so they become kind of less than innovative. <laughs> yeah, um, so I think that the new innovation demands for startup companies in China are going to be much more high tech than they used to be. It really, you know, the day that Groupon was announced, I think there were 650 competitors in China immediately. Same business, same kind of model. Now a Chinese entrepreneur is going to have to develop something more interesting to have a chance to be successful. Uh, that's just the way, you know, the innovation-based economic development works. Um, I think that if the Chinese big companies can develop a good ecosystem for open innovation, relationships with startup companies, they'll do really well. Um, that is the area where I think Japan and Korea has not done so well. And it's hard to tell. They're certainly doing investments. The big Chinese companies are doing a lot of investing. Whether they are really using the startup companies as strategic input to their major corporate strategy or not, like Google does, um, is hard to tell yet. Uh, so I do think that there's a danger that China will wind up recreating the Japanese Keidatsu model. Um, and that's really kind of what I had prepared for today. Thanks for listening so much. I'd love to hear your comments. Just like the people in Iraq, right? Yeah. So, what do you think their prospects are? Well, I think that, first of all, it is a huge question mark where this is going in China. If China is developing an innovation-driven economy, that's basically a market-driven economy. A market-driven economy, by definition, is not controlled by the state. And so, how long they can keep this coexistence without real pressure coming up is a good question. I'm afraid that the situation in Hong Kong may be an indicator. If they crack down and then they really go harsh under control again, that may have a real negative effect on innovation in China. And so I think it's a big question whether they're really moving apart that way or not. If they have a Tiananmen Square in Hong Kong, people become afraid. People, well, yeah, people want to do uh, what is the officially approved uh, solution to the problem. And, you know, having out of the box thinking is really essential in another kind of thing. Yeah, right. Right. How long can that last, really? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a, a, you've got a really good question. And part of the reason that's hard to deal with China is you can't see where it's headed. Um, I think that there's probably some latent feelings against the government that have not disappeared. Before Xi Jinping, people would criticize the government pretty openly. I was at a big dinner with, hosted by a successful kind of marketing guru at Tsinghua University, in fact, and said, ah, oh, the party's horrible. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he was really seriously angry. 
I, I was at another reception this year in Shanghai, and I kind of talked a little bit about U.S.-China situation, and this person came up to me at the end and said, Richard, to understand China, just remember, we have the biggest mafia in the world, the party. <laughs> so, okay. Now, whether crush them is the right idea or not, um, I think that severe enforcement of rule-based uh, kind of international standards would be a good thing. I think before Trump, uh, the Obama administration was way too weak, okay, in foreign policy and especially in regard to China. Um, and I think that what we've done, though, is we're not using the right tools. So the WTO, the World Trade Organization, is pretty weak and really needs a lot of help. It kind of reminds me of the League of Nations before World War II. So I hope we don't have to have a war to change this, but if they could give the WTO some teeth, you know, that could be to everybody's advantage. Yes, that's right. And that'll go on as long as this current administration is around. And unless people understand why an international rules-based system is better for everybody, we're always going to have populist people who look for somebody to blame for all of our problems and say we should crush them. I mean, you know, that's it's a great solution. The only problem is it's not right, <laughs> not the right one. <laughs> Go ahead. along very quickly and was that the result of capitalist involvement? Hell no. It was a result of open source development, taking no patents, exchanging information freely, moving ahead as fast as you can. That shows that the capitalist system based on patents and other corrupt devices does not work nearly as well as open source. And we ought to be focusing on that. Okay, I think you have a really good point. And I don't like a lot of the trappings of current capitalism, okay? When it's all about making every penny that you can make uh, at the expense of social good or at the expense of the environment or whatever, that's not the right thing. I agree that the internet was good because it was an open standard, but from my memory, things were really different after Netscape came along. And advertising came into the internet very soon after that. Uh, and so I, I kind of think that it's interesting what's happening with the big IT companies now. Everybody wants to have their own platform. IoT platform is like, you know, God, another one. Uh, and to take something that you develop in-house, like IBM Watson, where everything is in-house, and then turn it into a platform for third-party developers and third-party people to build applications on, you're opening it out, exactly as you say. So they're making that same choice, that openness and open source may be a better way to go. But they do that with the understanding that they can make money somehow. Now, um, I, I don't necessarily think that the current capitalist system is perfect by any means. And I don't necessarily like a lot of what we've come into now. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if we see the split up of the uh, big IT firms, you know, the Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon group, uh, just because we saw the oil companies split up in the 1920s. It's going to be the same kind of thing. And the oil companies now are not doing too badly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think the, 
there is a very important government for role in ensuring safety for people and ensuring, you know, enough kind of fairness that people can bring a new business idea to market. Um, I think that if you ask me what really bothers me about China right now, it's what's going on with the NBA, the NBA, right? Where now China's not going to broadcast nearly as many of the NBA games because of something that one of the NBA coaches said a few weeks ago. And that kind of paranoid uh, fear of what is said in the press is something that we won't be happy if that's the way things get to be here. Yeah, but but I do think you have a really good point. Thank you. About what's going on in China, Hong Kong, whatever. Yeah, we'll come back to that. Go ahead. Yeah, China is a big, rambunctious country. It has lots. It speaks several different dialects. Part of the manners had many revolutions in the past, and so the authorities in Beijing are very concerned about security. The thing that has the business community now out of this is they now. James Cohn, the former FBI director, that there ought to be no secrets from the government security forces because they could be subversive. And they're demanding that all countries, not companies, including the foreigners, turn over all of their encryption keys, use in from the inside China for all their servers, all the encryption keys that they use to communicate back to headquarters, right? And the company is afraid they're going to lose all their secrets. Well, and Apple was so horrible enough that it refused to open up an iPhone from somebody, you know, that had committed some horrible crime, in right? This country, in this country. country. Yeah, in this country. Um, and that is one of these basic kind of things that we've grown up with this uh, culture that values the privacy side. And there's always a trade off between privacy and security. If you tell the government everything about what you're doing, yeah, they'll take care of you. <laughs> my, my, my question, real quick, though, uh, this is a corporate question. Uh, is what's, what's the source of this Russian operating system that the Chinese are speaking to? The Chinese I speak to say they're, they're basically going to Linux. This Huawei system? I my understanding, it was developed at an institution in Moscow, some you know technology research institute. Oh, yeah. Probably is. They're also poking fork in the Android operating system just so that we can not be able to use some of their own versions of Android. But then they said, well, what they have to do is then they have to provide their own store and their own search engine. But they can certainly do that, buy it, yeah. et cetera. So they can fork it. Yeah. Uh, and you've got a big enough economy to support that kind of thing. Well, I think that it reveals what the Hoover Institution here calls sharp power. That uh, China really doesn't like any criticism of what China is doing. And uh, will take all kinds of measures to ensure that they're not criticized. And I was interviewed by Channel 7 about the Hong Kong situation about a month ago. And right before the camera started rolling, Kristen Z, the, the, the moderate, you know, the newswoman, asked me, are you neutral? <laughs> Where do you get your money? <laughs> Assuming that if I'm getting money from Chinese sources, that probably I'm not going to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Yeah. What? Oh, okay. Well, that's just fine. <laughs> you didn't miss much. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you had a comment too, right? You had a different comment? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I think that the sharp power is one of the real sticking points that um, is really hard to reconcile coexistence about. You know, I, I grew up in the Cold War. I remember what this was like. 
And we had all these things about peaceful coexistence and Khrushchev, you know, banging his shoe at the desk at the UN saying, we will bury you. Um, yeah, um, complete control over the media scares me because people make their decisions based on what they know. And if you don't have access to multiple sources of information, that's not a good thing. I mean, but I'm, I'm extreme. Ever since I was little, I used to DX with shortwave radio. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I, that's kind of what really bothers me about the NBA situation. Okay. About 25 years ago, you go to China and invest in a company there or something, they want to own 51%. Yeah. They own 49%. Right. About three years ago, they want to own 99%. <laughs> what, what's going on today? Was that just a negotiation issue? or Because my understanding is it does have to be 51%. Uh, and there may be some areas... You know, we have a few business areas and technology areas where we have limitations on foreign ownership of firms here in the U.S. And so it could be something like that, depending on what sector you're in. Um, but I also think that it's kind of what you can negotiate. And so if... Um, if you're able to have an enforceable contract where you're really getting the revenue that you want and you're not transferring technology that will be that will kill your competitiveness in the next generation of technology then um, ownership is not nearly as important as um, the cash <laughs> go ahead Um, you have a variation. I did have a chart somewhere about 5G adoption and what companies were saying, you know, we're going to go, we're not going to buy the Chinese stuff or we will buy from whoever we want to. Uh, my sense is that for the short term, the U.S. has allies that are aligned with it. The Japanese are definitely aligned with the U.S. The U.S. Yeah, uh, but that kind of thing could be changed relatively quickly, right? That's a decision that a government could make and change. Uh, I think that, well, when the kind of you know more harsh treatment of China in the current administration started, some of my contacts in Europe said, "Finally, the U.S. is getting serious about you know what these Chinese are doing." Partly because the person I was talking to had been in the, was an ambassador in the French government who had had to negotiate car issues with China. <laughs> and I do have a feeling that he kind of wanted the Americans to do the negotiation and then they'll come in and enter the market, right? <laughs> Just like all of our trade negotiations about apples and cherries and stuff. Uh, I, I think that our allies have been supportive up to a point. But almost everybody agrees that the tariffs are not right. The 1980s view of trade balances misses the structural issues of a global supply chain that really developed after the 1980s. And so, you know, the old solutions that we seem to be aiming for now are not going to work in the year 2020. Um, there's a lot of people who in those terms when I'm in foreign countries. I'm hearing that a lot. You and I are old enough to remember that. <laughs> a lot of people don't. If you're under 30, you don't know what the heck we're talking about. Uh, so I, I think that uh, uh, cause I, I could get people in China talking about the future of China pretty easy up until about 2013 or 2014. And now, just there's no upside to that kind of conversation. 
And I think that um, the Chinese are not doing the same kind of investment that the Japanese are because the Japanese, and this kind of goes back to your point, the Japanese big keidatsu companies that really emerged in this efficiency-driven economy era were private sector companies, and there was enough of them that they basically controlled the entire market. And in China, there's only a handful of the really giant IT companies now. And, you know, once you get through Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, maybe Huawei and higher, and uh, so uh, I think that that is kind of a different dynamic. So the Chinese are really doing more kind of purchasing-driven development where you know, if you, we've got a hundred million dollar project if you'll put in so many you know AI based stations in this kind of network um, and that is a different pattern than the Japanese approach I don't think there are the kind of joint industry labs in China that there were in Japan you know a big national project like the fifth generation project would have its central lab where all of the people came from competing companies, but they were working exactly. together. Failure. Yeah, it was a failure. <laughs> one, one, one footnote. Technically, it has to be delivered, but from an educational point of view, I talk to young people. Yeah. Their minds opened up. They know they react in very different ways. Yeah. The bottom line, technically, oh, we can fight them in a so this is why human resource development is always a goal of government programs, whether they admit it or not. No, but it can go against it. Yeah, it, it doesn't help the, the industry. doesn't necessarily do what the government wants them to do. Yeah, true. That's the point. Yeah. There have been specific uh, government national programs in China that have been enormous successes. Their hypersonic weapons program, uh, their hydrogen bomb program, Yeah. I mean, what we see well. what the United States seems to have lost the lack of the lack of doing. We don't do that anymore. Buy off the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get new high tech revolutionary development off the shelf. Yeah, that's true. I think it's easier to do it the first time around than once you've got an established system going. Because it really does look like government support for particular companies. And that's never been popular in the U.S. Yeah, but you almost never saw a brand name for who actually made the components of the, of the rockets and so forth. They were there. They were commercial yeah. providers. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with 5G coming out, uh, how much is locked up in Chinese IP? Well, in terms of locked up, 5G is a really complicated set of standards, and it's at least three major waves of standards. The first ones that's already starting to be deployed in places like South Korea and in China um, really uses frequencies that are not too different from the frequencies that are currently in use. The second and third generations will be using millimeter wave stuff. And that search phase still, that's still several years away. Now, what I've heard is that Huawei's technologies are probably several years ahead of anything anybody else has. In what way? More advanced. They work. Well, in what technically what better radios? Well, what better that? Soft well, um, I do think that the radio access for ultra high speed, through, you know, high speed communications, and also multi multiple stream communications, are something where five G handles data in a different way than four G does, and so they've they've solved a lot of those problems. How, much are you to, how are you going to divide up the load between edge processing and cloud processing, data center processing? Dynamic. 
it has to be dynamic, but you see, those are the areas where I don't necessarily think the Chinese are that far ahead. Those are areas that are still just emerging because they're application-driven areas. And um, I would look at the intelligent robot people as well as the, the self-driving car people as likely to have an impact on that. Probably the intelligence robot, intelligent robots more because it'd be easier to put 5G inside a factory than it will be inside a whole neighborhood. So, yeah, but I, I, you know, we were asleep. I don't really think they stole the IP from that many people to develop 5G. I think they had good government work that paid for the R&D and the government, they made a pitch to the government, said this is important, the government said go for it, and um, they developed the technology. 